Oh yes, we are live again this evening from Lagos, Nigeria, at the heart of Africa. I can see Mr. Leke Holder already is an efficient man. He didn't waste any time at all. Mr. Leke Holder is right here and we're going live with him. Fantastic. So I pray the internet behaves tonight. I pray the internet. Oh, it's connecting already. <laughs> Professor Socrates. Oh my well, God. Yes, Africa. <laughs> Go, I'm going to see you finally eh, <laughs> online. <laughs> wow. Madam Go. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> Please send my love to her always. Always. We will talk, we will talk later about our, our friends to France. That was, that, was, that, was, that was a ball. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having you. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. And I hope my viewers can see us. This is the great philosopher. I thought all the philosophers were dead until I met this man. <laughs> oh, global win. Thank you. Thank it's, you. It's so nice to see, you, to see you. Thank you. You are watching from the UK. Thank you so much. Yes, <laughs> I am so excited. Tonight we are partying on this show. Trust me, we are going to party. Because <laughs> a lot of people think you are too serious. They don't know that you know how to party. <laughs> you know, when I tell people I know him, it's my friend. It's like, what do you mean? How can you know him? You know, so I'm, I'm so excited to have you. So uh, are people able to reach us from uh, Facebook? Great. From Twitter and on YouTube. Okay, so we're good to go, sir. It's just one minute past eight uh, now. But the usual protocol is that we will start, we'll play music, I'm sure you will enjoy. And we're starting with the old mama. Dana Rose. Oh. Yes, <laughs> I am coming out. We are coming out now. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> lined up for the great professor. We want people to see what they've not seen, what they didn't know about you. Somebody said, oh, professor is laughing today. <laughs> they think you don't even laugh. <laughs> you see the I, myth. I, I think they are used to my work rather than they myself. They are used to your work rather so that is why today we want to make you relax. Now go to Shalala for me, a night to remember. <laughs> You, you know, know something wrong in those days. Shalama, a night to remember. You know what people yeah. don't know is that when I was in the first year in the university, um, yes, I, I'm, I'm hearing you, please. I was in a club called Pioneers Club at University of Ife, and we had an arrangement with Ben Bruce. So he will bring the bands from America, and we will bring them to our Ife and sponsor them in Ife and all those. I was the social secretary of that club. 
Uh, wow. Well, we made a lot of money. But, you know, we brought Lakeside, Shalama, Whispers, Whispers, all of them. Now, to I will tell you a story, a secret <laughs> that you probably didn't know. I was the rain catcher. Anytime you brought those artists, <laughs> I was the Babalawo that they contracted. I, I was to too young. I was just 16 or 17. <laughs> exactly. So you wouldn't know me at that time. And the last one failed me, and that was Whispers. You know, when you brought Whispers, and the, the whole auditorium, the, the amphitheater was jam packed with the crowd <laughs> waiting for Whispers. <laughs> then I went to the Babalawo in town and I told Babalawo that I have a big show. So I'd been paid. It was uh, the late Femi Shegun who gave me the contract. So they contacted and I said, don't worry, I have a friend in Yoruba who knows a lot about uh, Juju. And then, <laughs> so they gave me the Juju to go and bury in the amphitheater. Just at the appointed time, you will not believe it. I remember. Started. It I just had to run away, and the students <laughs> went on rampage. I couldn't show my face for this. <laughs> and one of my friends who was with us in Ife at that time, Wally Adeyemo, is watching us right now. <laughs> what is from, from North Carolina. What a day. Okay, so we will do Shalama. We will do Shalama now. <laughs> Attend if and you will not have fond memories. So, Definitely. <laughs> Professor Socrates, you are welcome. On Thank you. Tonight. A lot of people don't know why I call you Professor Socrates. As I mentioned earlier on, I used to think that all the philosophers like Aristotle, like Plato, like Socrates, all of them died even before Christ was born. But trust me, <laughs> One of them has resurrected in Nigeria, <laughs> and that is Mr. Licky Holder. <laughs> <And Love me. laughs> let, let me tell you a story about this man that you may not know. In 2007, <laughs> I think before 2007, we got for about two years. I was looking for Licky. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find him. Then I found him finally in 2007. And I told him, do you know how long I've been looking for you? He said, he's sorry. He's been busy. Okay, no problem. So what can I do? And I told him that Ovation has been very remarkably successful, but we needed to give back something to the society. And I wanted him to be my brain box. Me, I couldn't think like him. You know, philosophers <laughs> think a lot. So I told him, please, I, they are the only person who can design something for us that will be eternal. He said, why not? He said, I should give him my vision. I did. And he won't believe it. He will pick his chalk and all that and he will be writing on the board. He will be writing. And oh my God. And I remember Taiwo, Shibumi and all of them at the time. That's right. Great, great, great man. And he asked me to come back for a presentation in a few days. You will not believe it. This brilliant mind, within days designed what has become ovation red carrot tea today this is the man who did it thank you so much sir <laughs> thank, thank you, you so thank much you. For, for i cannot body. thank you enough because you left everything and you sacrificed everything and we did only two presentations to potential sponsors only two we went to uba we went to glow in fact before we could get to glow uba already approved that i remember <laughs> 
of let the others work. And uh, may God continue to bless you. May God continue to bless your family. May you never lie. May God bless the nation too. I'm so, I'm so emotional tonight about this man. So let's start from the okay. very beginning, from your primary school. I want you to take, you are, you are a natural teacher. You are a natural lecturer. So lecture us about the story of your life. Uh, well, I was born to um, my parents, my father and my mother. Uh, I was born in Lagos. Um, I'm an only child of my mother. Uh, in Yoruba language, you say that is Omokupo. Uh, the poverty oh. of the English language will not capture the essence of that. Oh, uh, Omokupo. Oh. <laughs> it means it that must not be touched. <laughs> And the only one that is a plurality, <laughs> you know. So my mother was very guarded about me because she almost lost her life giving birth to me. Um, that's why my first name is Samuel. And my full middle name is Uluwa Niko. And uh, uh, my mother is from the prince. She's a princess from the Akitoye family. My father, on the other hand, is affiliated with the Campbell family. My great-grandmother was a Campbell. Uh, of Campbell Street in Lagos, and then we're affiliated to the Jack on Day family and all those things. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Lagos person, uh, even though the elders are from Abekuta, Lagos, and also from Wari. I don't know much about Wari, I don't know much, too much about Abekuta, but I know about Lagos. Uh, I went to a primary school in Lagos, North and Primary School in Lagos. My father was a civil servant, um, also. I went to Igbobi College and also King's College. And then from King's College, I went to the University of Ife to go and read law. And then, um, which is, when you look at my journey, it's quite fortuitous. Um, I tried to read other disciplines after law, but I kept on dropping out because I didn't have money, <laughs> you know. And that's because I'd made up my mind that I would never ask my parents again for money after my first degree. So every time I got admission, I had to drop out because I didn't have the money. Maybe that's why I'm particular by helping other people in education, you know, today. Yeah. It's, it's been, and my, my father was a great influence of me. Uh, he's late, he's been late for about five years. Um, he taught me... So rest in peace. Uh, he taught me discipline, hard work. Um, he was a content man. He was a civil servant. But he was a very, very good father, a very sacrificial father. I mean, think about it. My father will buy me 400 naira Italian suits to wear in university, whereas he himself would rather go and sew safari suits. Now, 400 naira, as you can remember in those days in Ife, that was a lot of money. You could feed for an entire month with 40 naira. So for a civil servant to sacrifice those kinds of things, and he did it all throughout my schooling, from King's College to university. I mean, the shoes I wore in King's College, I conveniently wore them in university because they were designer shoes. I remember I wore, I bought Giorgio Brutini, you know, and all sorts of things. And I used to buy sample shoes. Uh, but I tried my best not to disappoint him by being very, very good at my academics. I won a scholarship in the university, and the scholarship was given to seven of the best students in the University of Ife, and wow. I was one of the seven. Uh, so I went to school on scholarship. Um, again, maybe that's why I'm also particular by education for other people, and why I believe that the country can do better if we do pay more attention to education. So it's, in a summary, that's my life. <laughs> that's my background. Uh, could we take it stage by stage, primary school, your recollection, secondary school, your memories of secondary school, and then uh, Ife. Of course, we must talk about great Ife. Okay. Um, primary school in those days were controlled by, missionary, by missionaries. So the primary school that I went to was attached to a Methodist school, a Methodist church. My parents were Methodist. Were Methodist. Um, so my primary school was Thomas Oaris Memorial Methodist School which was attached to the Ereko circuit. So it would be known as Ereko Methodist School. Uh, and that was at Berkeley School in Onuka. Um, nursery School was right across my father's office on Marina. Uh, it was a Baptist nursery school. 
And um, Igbope College was quite interesting. Before I was born, my parents had made up their minds that I was going to go to Igbope College because generations of elders had gone to Igbope College. I mean, you can't be an older and not go to Igbope College. So before I was born, my father had made up his mind <laughs> I was going to Igbope College. But then I finished Igbope College. I finished um, the second best in my set uh, and the best art student. Um, and then um, I didn't know what to do after that. And, but, you know, I learned a lesson from my father. Be good to people. Be kind to people. Uh, one of my father's messengers happened to be passing in front of King's College, and he had an admission going on in King's College. So he ran back to the office and insisted that Oga's son must go to King's College. That's why I go to King's College, you know. And um, I did extremely well in King's College. I'd already been promised a British Caledonian scholarship to go and study in the UK. And while I was studying for that, I mistakenly, or out of rascality, I did jump. Um, now, how did that occur? My mates were talking about going to do jump. I wasn't interested because I wanted to go to the UK. Um, but out of rascality, because I was the best student in the class, I just wanted to beat them. So I, so I took jump, <laughs> you know, just to beat them, <laughs> you know. And then jump results came out, and I did extremely well. Uh, I think I was number two out of 70 students that were admitted for IFE, for wow. IFE law. And then my parents told a change and said, did you say IFE? I said, yes. Did you say law? I said, yes. They said, well, you have to go. I said, well, not about Britain. They said, forget about Britain. Forget it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and that's how I got into IFE. Now, what is interesting in IFE is that my first year in the university, I held an art exhibition. And um, I think that was at the beginning of the second year, I held an art exhibition, and it was attended by over 2,000 people. That's the largest wow. ever art exhibition in the history of the university. And it was reported by Guardian newspapers and some other newspapers. And the story of my life just changed, you know. Um, I started holding a lot of art exhibitions all over the place. And um, my work was being reproduced, posters. I mean, thousands of my posters were being sold out. And I started working professionally, even though I was a law student. But at the same wow. time, I was working as an art student. And then, but I didn't know then that that is pointing to the future. But you never know mm. this thing, you know. And then, so the lesson that I've learned is that whatsoever you, you find, your, your hand finds to do, put in your best because you don't know whether you are creating your future. Wow, wow. So while at Ife and doing law, did you ever take courses in philosophy? Because I want to know where your <laughs> philosophy came from. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, if a, if a law was very rigorous, um, the first year we took no course in law itself. You know, I came to study law itself. It's interesting. As a 10-year-old, there was a television program called The Main Chance on TV. And um, I loved it. There was a brilliant lawyer, a British lawyer. He had a beautiful girlfriend. He was brilliant in court. He was brilliant out of court. He dressed very well. And I said, I want to be like this kind of guy. You know, so that was the main guy that influenced me to go and study law. And then I got to Ife, and um, with the first year was the most fantastic year for me. And it's still the most useful year for me in terms of my work. We studied sociology. We studied economics. We studied history. We studied English. We studied logic. We studied philosophy, Greek philosophy, so many philosophy courses. And it was just, it was just incredible. It was, it was it was beautiful, just beautiful, you know, and that's where my my love of uh, philosophy came from, uh, if you like. <laughs> Although I I think it's my father actually because um, we used to take strolls a lot when I was young. My father and I were very close, so on the streets it would point to big words. I'm talking about like when I was like four years old or five years old. And he'll point to big words on signboards and say, what is that? I will pronounce it. And he'll say, okay, now close your eyes and spell it, you know. And then my father in primary school insisted that all my notes, that I must cram them, all the notes. So you have to talk like 12 full cap notes in a year, you know, and I will cram them. So when I go to the to exam, it's like regurgitating. It's like looking at a picture, you know. So that's how I developed photographic memory. You know, wow. and I did all that till I got to university. Of course, in law, you have to cram a lot of cases and things like that. 
I mean, an average year in law, you have to cram about 1,000 cases, you know, and you have to be able to cite them. So I, I believe that those are the kind of influences that determine what I became eventually. Wow. I, I, I'm hoping that some teachers and education administrators are watching this program because what you are actually seeing here is about our learning methods and methodology. And I think when you say the quality of education has dropped, it's the way people are taught nowadays. Because I, see. I experienced the same thing with Mrs. H. Sutton, who was my literature teacher. Every wow. week when we had a lecture, she would tell you when you are coming next week, you must have learned a biku by Wally Shoyinka, a biku by John oh. Pepe Clark. <laughs> so everything must be in your brain. And when yeah. you come, you have to vomit it out. And that's the, exactly what your dad was doing. And that's the best way to actually exercise the brain. Yeah, and, and I had good literature teachers. And for example, now that you mentioned literature, when I was in secondary school, I was barely 10 years old. And my literature teacher would look at the syllabus and then he would call my dad and ask him to buy extra syllabus material, extra syllabi. So if we studied Tom Sawyer in school, I had to buy Okuberifin, you know, and then we, mm. by the age of 10, I read The Man Died, you know, and all these poems that you are citing and everything. And I read a lot of the African writer series. And I learned the style of Role in and the way he wrote and things like that. But those teachers challenge us to go beyond ourselves. And I learned, I learned something. It's not what you learned in school. It's not the syllabus that matters. It's the extra syllabus that matters. That's what makes the man. It's how far you can go outside what is prescribed to help yourself in life. That's what eventually determines what you become. Wow. That's what they call complete education. There is no <laughs> way you are soaked in complete education and you will not extend. If you look behind me here, you can see the African writer series. Some oh, yes. I'm about 40 years old. You won't believe it. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I've kept them ever since. I have them I, on the other bookshelves there. I, I remember reading Kofi Awono. This art, ah, my brother. This art, my brother. He died. <laughs> and, I was, oh, and I was quite intrigued by the way it was written. Philosophy of oh. one side and then the story on the other. I and mean, it was just absolutely, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> you know, and then, it. Oh, wow. Go on. Go and on. then when we read Macbeth in those days, um, we didn't read, I mean, you cramped Macbeth. You have to so when they're showing, so you, and they're showing the film, you are reading Macbeth. I mean, you are literally, you got so, I mean, till today I can tell you act one, sing one, <laughs> Macbeth and wow. things like that. When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, thunder, and rain? When the only body is gone. I come gray mark, and fall 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 you know, I can still remember all those things, you know. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> if it were done when it is done, it were done. If it were done quickly. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that trots and frets is now upon the stage. And then he said no more. It's a thing. So bad, full of sand and fury, signify nothing. Since then, oh, can you believe it? Oh, my God. I was supposed to come and watch this show. I beg. <laughs> they should come and watch. <laughs> Professor Socrates. Now, when you studied philosophy, which of the Greek philosophers was your favorite? Um, Socrates. <laughs> I, I don't know why I chose Socrates for you as, as your nickname. It's strange. <laughs> Because he invented a, a, what they call the Socratic method, which was a way of asking a series of questions that elicit, elicit further questions and which lead you to the answer, you know. And wow. because I was going to study law, you know, you have to have the Socratic method and be able to do cross-examination and all those kinds of things. And um, so Socrates was, was... But sociology and economics were also very powerful for me. Um, all throughout my school, I had A's in, um, in economics, and then um, because I thought it was such a simple and interesting subject matter. And then sociology. Um, I remember I finished my sociology exam, a two-hour exam. I finished it in 10 minutes, you know, and it was so bad that I forgot to write my name. So I was penalized. 
10 marks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? But I still made a B plus, <laughs> you know, even with the penalization, you know, but those were interesting days. I mean, you must love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. You know, there's something ennobling about it. Wow. So how come you didn't practice law? Did you ever practice law? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> now, what happened was, um, remember, I had done this art exhibition in school, and I kept on buying art materials and art materials. Now, my father was a graphic artist with the Ministry of Information. If they were in charge of all the government, if my father were alive now, they would be the one doing the posters, advising us on COVID-19 and things like that. So I was exposed to high-level art uh, standards from the age of, I think I did my first professional artwork at the age of 10, you know. And um, so I was used to dealing with people at that level. But by the time I held my art exhibition, my life completely changed, you know. And then um, I, after I came out of university, I tried to practice law. I mean, I did it for... I went for to Bauchi for Yutko, but something interesting happened in Yutko, and that's where my visitative life start, started. Um, I had facial paralysis um, wow. during Yutko, and then I could not talk, I could not smile, I could not eat properly, um, I could not close my eyelids, you know, I had to shut it out, you know, shut it down. And so I had to leave Bauchi and come down to Lagos for therapy. And um, eventually it was God who healed me because when I, I mean, I had a lot of medical uh, friends, medical student friends. I used to go a lot to, I used to go for medical uh, lectures in Luth because I had friends who were studying medicine in Luth. So we just go for medical lectures and things like that. And so I read myself that there was no known cause and there was no known cure. So I had to depend on God to heal me. And, um, and that's, that was a major, 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 major thing in my life. And then after that, I started working in the law firm. I tried to work for one year, but it, it just wasn't working for me. And um, one day I'm sitting down on my desk and I, I, I said to myself, what if I die now? Will I regret not using my talent? And I said, the answer is yes. And right there and then I picked a piece of paper and I resigned from the law firm. I was a very, very good lawyer. You know, um, but I just resigned from the law firm. They, they're not knowing what to do or anything. But I knew that if I didn't resign then and I marry or any of those things, it would be difficult for me to do what I want to do in life. You know, so that's how, that's how I ended up uh, setting up a design company. Uh, it was tough, you know. Uh, but along the way, um, the Italian embassy came, the German embassy came, the British embassy came because of the quality of my work. And then it, it, I'll tell you later about, you know, the, the, the breakthroughs and everything, you know. But I couldn't practice law for more than a year. And that was Yutko. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. People are thanking you for speaking <laughs> out. A lot of people will bury these things within themselves. They don't want oh. to say, they want to say only the success part. I mean, look at no. that kind of huge challenge, almost losing your life. Yeah, I, I, there were other challenges as well. I mean, I went through marital challenges that almost killed me, you know. Um, I was in and out of hospital for about 10 years. Um, I could not work at all that consulting for an entire year. I, I don't, I, you see, I, I don't believe in hiding the truth from people because you don't really help anybody. You give this impression that you were born in Palms or in, in, in one of the supermarkets and everything, and that's, 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 not, that's not true. Um, so you don't give the youths a, a true picture of what life is. So when trials come, they don't know what to do. So I don't hide all these things from my children. And if I have, I let them know. If I don't have, I let them know so that they know that in life, you learn how to abound and you learn how to abase and you learn how to manage your money. And, and um, But I believe that one of the reasons why the young people listen to me is because I always tell the truth. Hmm. Fantastic. Before we continue, I said... Tonight is a night of music as well because we're celebrating a great mind. And in your choice of music, I realized that we have so many in common. And one of them happens to be Sister Sledge. I actually hosted oh, them in Ghana. They came to my house when uh, Auntie Maima Bilo Osage had her 50th birthday. They flew them into Ghana 
and I was able to uh, uh, persuade them to come to the house for, the, and they said they didn't want to go back to America. <laughs> you know? So we, we have Sister Sledge right now. <laughs> We have more for you coming. Don't worry. Now, um, all that consulting. My first time noticing all that consulting, you were running some adverts. I wouldn't remember the newspapers, but you were running all that consulting adverts. And the designs looked like something out of heaven. They looked <laughs> esoteric. They looked abstract. And I'm like, who is this? I never knew our paths would even cross at all. So tell us about starting all that consulting at the beginning and then the time you had your break. Okay, well, then you are forcing me to say things that I don't say in public. <laughs> Please. Tonight okay. Is tonight. Um, remember, I had left law, you know, so and I didn't know what to do. So I was doing this design consultancy. And then um, two young people came to me. They had imported typewriters into the country. And they didn't have money for advertising. They didn't have any marketing budget. They were broke. So they came to me and said, what can you do for us? We don't have any money. So I told them they should go away for a week. And after one week, they should come back. I'll have the solution to them for them. So I designed a small business card. On one side of that card, it read, if brother typewriters had existed at the time of Moses. Moses would have used it to write the Ten Commandments. Then on the other side, I put their contact details and everything. So they went marketing. And within a month, they had sold over 1,000 typewriters. Wow. <laughs> you know. And one of the companies that they sold the typewriters to was one of these budding, the newest in mobile phones were new in the country at that time. So those guys saw the card and said, who did this? And so they said, oh, it's a young man. And it is. so they, I turned out that that was the marketing director of that company. He said, who did this? So eventually, after one month, I finally went to see the guy. And he said to me, he said, look, <clears throat> we have huge inventory. We have no sales whatsoever. <clears throat> what can you do for us? So again, I told him, give me one week. You know, I will come back. Now, at this time, I was a naive young man who didn't know anything about the corporate world. I'd never worked in a corporate world, you know. So I, I did a simple analysis of the markets, the mobile phone market, as I understood it. I broke down the generational thinking, the psychology of the generation. And just to illustrate what I was saying, I did one or two or three adverts and attached. And at the end of the page, I put all that consult, you know, and I put a bio about myself. I read law and everything. So I went to see this gentleman with this, my package. I didn't know that was what you call the proposal in those days. I thought the proposal was what you told the girl, <laughs> you know. So I gave it to him. He read the first paragraph. 
and he said, excuse me, give me five minutes. So he went upstairs and went to see his boss. His boss happened to be a young man who had just come back from the UK. And the first boss read the first paragraph and said, who did this? So they said, okay, can we bring him up? So I was brought up and the boss said, so what do we pay all that consult? And I mentioned what would be termed a ridiculous price. I mean, it was enough to buy about 10 Mercedes. And the guy said, done, on one condition, wow. that you also handle my companies in the UK. And I think that year I made about, you're talking about 25, 20 something years ago, uh, I made about 1 million naira that particular year. That was a lot of money for a young man in those days. Wow. And then, but that company went from zero to a hundred million naira sales in six months. It was wow. ridiculous. I mean, it was ridiculous. The next year, they called me and doubled how much they were paying me as consultancy fee. And also, I was handling other things because the sales were there. Now, what did I do? I came up with something that I call conversational advertising, in which you are talking to the market rather than talking at the market. And I wanted it to be a conversation. So, and I gave self to myself a creative challenge that every day of the year, I will bring out a different advertisement every day of the year just to engage the public. And that company became like a club. I mean, people were trooping to that company. You know, I remember I ran an advert that says, all hell broke loose when Jennifer called or something. And everybody rushed to that company and said, I want to talk to Jennifer. I want to talk to Jennifer. I want to talk to Jennifer. You know, so those, those were, that, that's how it started. It was just one little job, you know. And then what led me to the Italian embassy? Um, a Lebanese client had come and said they had no money. And they wanted to do an advert for his art exhibition. And I helped him write a simple letter, you know, and I designed the letter. And he took it to the Italian embassy to give them to come to his exhibition. And they were so shocked at the European standard of design and the clarity of the English, the simplicity of the English, that they gave me a contract to start producing all Italian things in Nigeria. Wow. Um, wow. I was working for the Italian Cultural Attaché uh, at the um, Cultural Institute. I was working for the Italian International School. I was working for the Italian Embassy itself. I produced all the ideas for all the Italians that were working in Nigeria and living in Nigeria. I mean, that's a lot of trust. But one thing I always did, I always delivered on my promises, no matter what mm. it took. Um, I remember once we were producing something for the Italian embassy, and the job was late when I was given. But there was no, those were days when I used to go to Shomulu and sleep in the press, you know, just to make sure that my work is done and that it matches the standard that I wanted. And there was no light whatsoever in Shomolu. We rented the first generator, it broke down. We rented second generator, it broke down. We rented third wow. generator, it broke down. <laughs> then, just as I'm praying, Nepa brought light. There was just enough to power one small machine. And what was bad enough, it couldn't mix ink with it. So I'll turn on the lights of my car. We'll mix the ink with the light of my car. <laughs> you know, and everything, wow. and then we'll print and everything. And the next day, I went to the Italian embassy and delivered. I didn't mention to them what I had to go through. In fact, I thought of taking Nepal from the third street to where I was. As we were on that, Nepal took life on that third street as well. I mean, those wow. were bad days, you know. But I, I just don't believe in excuses. If you make a promise, keep your promise. That is integrity. My father taught me two things. Keep people's confidences, keep people's integrity, keep your integrity. You know, so those are things that have guided me and um, our clients trust us that we will always deliver. Well, I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, one of the greatest jobs you ever did was with Guarantee Trust. <laughs> <laughs> I know every client is special, but... <laughs> Till tomorrow, I have not seen any work like that. Could you just tell us, you don't have to go into the nitty gritty, just tell us about <laughs> what came into your brains at that moment when you got that brain? You know, when people think about branding, first of all, people need to know that there was nothing called branding in Nigeria. Um, there was, um, 
I don't want to go too much into that, but what had happened was that the banks were using quantitative metrics to measure their brands, which I felt was wrong, that they had to be a combination of quantitative and qualitative metrics. So we came up with something, a system of measuring the brands in the service sector, it's here the banking industry, and we called it the Older Brand Report, which was how branding started in Nigeria. That was in 2001. And then um, Guarantee Trust Bank called us. They had just changed their logo, but they were, they were like a minority in the market. The, there were other banks that were defining the market. So what we needed to do was to create a strategy that made them the dominant force in the market. And in order to introduce that strategy, we made people wake up to one morning and everybody just saw all over town these orange boxes in the middle of the streets called orange rules, orange rules, orange rules, orange rules. And everybody kept asking, what is orange rules? What is orange rules? <laughs> now, wow. what people don't know is that it was a defensive strategy. Uh, orange telecoms was coming into the country at that time, and we wanted to own the color orange. So we started shouting orange rules, orange rules, orange rules. Also, we now began to define the values of the banking system with the guaranteed trust values, guaranteed trust bank values, just to take the, 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 the pressure away from them and also to subdue uh, organizations like UBA <laughs> and things like that. And it succeeded monumentally. Um, the late Tayo Adelioku, I remember meeting him at the airport and he said, okay, I don't understand what you guys did because they argued with our strategy, you know, mm. but I said they should just trust us. And then he said, okay, I don't know what you guys did, but whatever it is, we're making it crazy worked. money, <laughs> you know. Wow. And it, 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 it was just a fantastic job. There were many other jobs like that. It's just that we're a quiet company and um, we've, we've always just been a quiet company. <laughs> wow. No, you till today they control orange. I don't think they are synonymous <laughs> with orange. When once you see orange, your mind only goes to guarantee trust. And this is something That's you did that many years ago. Many, many years ago. Fifteen years ago. Wow. <laughs> we we didn't forget we did for First Bank. We our major works were with the were with the banking sector. Um, First mm. Bank, uh, and along the way, the consultants themselves started coming to us because we had evolved this system that was working and yielding results. Um, it was counterintuitive. It didn't make sense. But you have to be bold about what you know. Um, you, you, you have to, once you are sure of what you are doing and your conscience is clear, then deploy it for your clients. And our clients were getting results, whether SMEs, whether big corporations, whether consultancies themselves, the results were there. Um, we've never advertised, and we still don't advertise. We don't have a marketing department. We've never had a signboard, you know, all these 25 years. And then God has just been kind to us. And I've been lucky to work with people who are dedicated. I mean, extremely, extremely, extremely dedicated and loyal people who have stood with the ethos of the company and the vision of the company. And we just keep on going on and keep on putting in our best. Yes, I remember when you were on Legally I already by just <laughs> Adio, that corner. And I was That's looking it. for your office. I went up and down, up and down. I didn't know where you were. <laughs> and your office didn't look like an office to me. I'm like, I, I will tell my driver, are you sure this is the place? And then we took a risk and we asked. And then we said, they said we should come in. Fantastic <laughs> job. Fantastic Thank job you. you've been doing. I mean, you have a lot of diehards like me as your fans. Anyway, another person I discovered lately is my dear sister, T.Y. Delo. Oh, my God. Oh, my. You will believe some of your pictures that I used. I had to beg T.Y. that T.Y. should send the pictures. <laughs> I don't know if she's watching. T.Y. actually worked with us. She served the youth call with us. And oh, wow. what a wonderful, wonderful, talented young woman. Very, I mean, she's no longer a young woman. My, to me, she'll always be a young woman. And she's my daughter. <laughs> wow, wow. Fantastic talent. Another, Fantastic another talent. person who swears by your name is my dear brother, Tell you Baby Face. I've been lucky to relate a lot to the people in the entertainment industry, but in a quiet level, because at that level, they need confidentiality and they need someone they can trust and that they someone that they can see anything to and who is not shocked by whatever is going on in their life. 
Um, I remember Kore De Bello, um, he had released this song and I played in church. And I mean, all the Pharisees came after him, you know, and they were going to destroy this young man. And I didn't know who he was. So I wrote an article from a theological ex perspective explaining that what these guys were doing was Pharisaism and it wasn't in accordance with the New Testament. And I never knew him. And then one day I'm on the way to Abuja and then the, the flight was overbooked. The business class section was overbooked. And so the flight couldn't take off because no big man will give up any seat for anybody. So I said, what is the problem? They said the flight is overbooked. I said, can you take me to economy? So, and that was how the flight was resolved. But as I got into the cabin of the plane, I just noticed that all the celebrities were standing up and all of them insisted that I should take the business class and that they would rather go to economy. That was the first time I saw Kurede Bello, you know, and that was the first time I met Sheyi Law, who I didn't even know, you know. Eventually, Sheyi Law was the one who gave up his seat in the business class section and went to sit in the economy. But again, the lesson I learned is that just be good to people. Just because you, life is life is life is funny. Life is a, it's a very very small world, you know. And that young man that I seem to have helped in those days, you know, look at how well he's doing now, you know. And I'm glad to have contributed my little piece to his life. Hmm. No, no, no. You've contributed to so many lives, including mine. Thank you. Just Thank one you. design of Ovation Red Carol till today you will not believe it. We've never struggled for sponsorship. Last wow. year, the Reverend Mother Yadura came on stage. She came physically on stage. She said she must announce this. And she's done it for three times. She said, I'm committed to 10 years. of I, I was oh, in tears. Wow. <laughs> this is something that this man designed. Never looked back. Never asked for anything. You just contribute your Ah, your life to other people's lives. May God bless you. May God bless but you. They, I, I, I couldn't ask you for anything because when I met you, I, I had this feeling, this this sense that you're a good man and that you're good-hearted and that uh, goodwill just has to, I have to give my goodwill towards you, uh, which was why we didn't charge anything or any of those things. And and. I'm convinced that I made the right choices and that I, I see count you as one of the most dependable allies, you know, one can have in life and that wow. you will stay in one's corner and that you'll be loyal to your friends, you know, and wow. it's, it's been so many years and we've still been friends. It's, you've wow. still been friends. Wow. You're a good uh, man, Bob. I'm, I'm, I'm practically in tears, but that's fine. Uh, we will give you Commodores. The night is the night. We will give you night shift. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. Oh, 
<laughs> wow, 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 wow. Now Those are memories, going, memories, 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 memories. I'm telling you, you know, that was the signature music at Night Shift Coliseum. Ken Kale to Lumezi. Ken Kale to Lumezi. Godfather. Ah, no, we had fun, no. We had fun yeah. in our time. Right? No, no, no. I'm sure clubs don't play such music these days. Now it's noise, noise, noise. <laughs> anyway, now I want us to go to a different topic that I know is very close to your heart. Your relationship with your faith. Can you tell us about it? I, I see you do a lot with different churches, even if they, they are not the churches you attend yourself. But you are giving lectures almost every Sunday. I see you in different places. Yeah, I, I, first of all, I believe that it's a very puerile existence and a very febrile um, pursuit of ephemeral, ephemerality if you don't have spirituality in your life. I mean, I've sat down to look at life without spirituality and I've come to the conclusion that it's just not possible that you'll be a two-dimensional cardboard creature without spirituality. And then, but I noticed that a lot of young people were not being taught the right thing. Uh, they were not being taught theology. They were being taught fast food Christianity, in which it's all about claiming it, claiming it, you know, without commensurate hard work and discipline and values and all those things. So I decided to start writing something called Illuminari. And that's because we did a Google search and we discovered that the most researched word by the young people in that particular year was Illuminati. Illuminati. You know, so, Illuminati. So I decided to come up with something called Illuminari. Now, amazingly, it just it just became a global phenomenon. You know, um, um, Illuminari and Jack and Jill. I started writing letters about Jack and Jill as well, which was a relationship blog. And those letters became read in 182 countries. I was answering about 7,000 mails a year. Um, I was getting it one particular year. We had it of 120 something million, you know, and we were being read in Iran, in Kazakhstan, in, uh, in Russia, in England, in all over the world. I mean, it was just shocking. I mean, there's hardly anywhere I've been in the world that somebody is not who is not reading those letters. I thought that put me sometimes at the airport. I've been known to be followed to the. I was in Dubai. Somebody followed me to the bathroom. You know, I was in Ghana. Somebody followed me to the bathroom and everything. And you know, so it. I, I don't know why. You know, um, I think it's just like most of the things in my life that if you give glory to God and don't try to appropriate them to yourself, I think God will take care of all the rest. I think the problem most of the time is that we're all trying to prove that we're self-made men. And a self-made man is not somebody that should be associated with God because that's an odious um, entity. And then um, I, I don't know why. Um, like, I, I, Bob D, this is my life. You know me. I, it's not based on any personal intelligence or anything. It's just the kindness and the favor of God. And so everything that I have, Everything that I have is a gift. Everything is a gift. So there's no basis for boastfulness or arrogance or pride. Um, I'm humbled by the things that God has given me, including friendships, even being on this platform. Um, you mm. don't normally, I mean, you don't normally call people like me to this kind of platform. I mean, I'm oh, a consultant. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the whole idea is to promote the best brains of Africa. That's my mission. That's all. Thank you. And Thank you. Nobody, nobody can contradict me on this. That Lady <laughs> Alda is one of the brightest stars of Africa. Nobody can challenge wow. me on that. I can assure Thank you. you. Yes, Thank um, you. I know a teacher must also have teachers. Can you talk about some of your own teachers? Not necessarily in school, yes. but even out of school. Your mentors, your heroes. And in terms of that spirituality, in terms of spirituality, the person that has helped me the most in resolving the world and scriptures has been Reverend Chris Okote. Um, wow. He's cerebral, as you well know, and um, he's very intelligent. So his analytical posture on the scriptures has helped me to reconcile a lot of things and have an understanding of God. And based on these teachings, I'm able to do my own further exploration 
and go further. Um, another person that has influenced me is the late Ravi Zacharias. Uh, he just died. Brilliant man, extremely brilliant man, a Christian apologist. Um, I tend to write at the intersection of the spirituality and the secularity, you know, cross-mingling the two so that people can understand how things were in those days. For example, I will explain to young people that David was a blogger. You know, he wasn't a psalmist, you know, the, you know, the way people say sound, because not all his blogs were written, were songs. Mm. But he was also a guitarist, he was a rap player, he was a rap artist, you know, and things like that. So the young people can better relate to him. And why am I so particular about God? Because the truth is that my life will be absolutely, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing without God. I mean, there is nothing to it. So when I say, for example, that God, I surrender all to you, I'm not trying to be religious. I'm just stating a fact. When I say that, God, you are everything to me, I'm not trying to be religious. I'm just stating a fact. It's, it's as real to me as we're talking. And every aspect of my life, every difficulty I've had has been there with me. I mean, this was a God who followed Joseph to prison. So that tells you how far God will go with you if you want to go with him. So God means a lot to me. And... Um, the circumstances of my birth, the circumstances of my illnesses, the challenges I've faced through in life, the successes I've had in life, the fame, the, 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 the material blessing, it's, it's just virtually impossible without God. Now, I'm not disrespecting other people's view of God. Um, some people don't believe that God is relevant, and I respect that. But at the same time, they must also respect my own experience and the realities of my life. Wow, wow. Now I will match the next two questions I have for you. I will match them. You okay. are a world traveler. We, are, we share that in common. <laughs> That's you, right. you remember there was an artwork you gave me that I will never forget. You asked me to send you all my travel tickets, the stops, and you created them into an artwork by British Airways. Virgin Atlantic, Emirates. I don't know how you came about that idea, but it was presented to me in the office. Can you tell me about your work travels and your passion for photography? It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> along the way, we I have a foundation. That foundation supports nine orphanages and also offers scholarships to many people quietly. And then... Um, and then we feed the poor on a regular basis at Older Consulting. I think once a month, we go to the, to the camps and we feed the poor and those that are destitute. Every month we do that. So if you work at Older, that, that's part of your regimen. You have to participate in that program. Um, but I wanted to find a way to help the less fortunate. So I decided that um, I, when I travel, that I would take photographs from all over the world and I hold an art exhibition. And when I hold the exhibition, I'll call my friends and those that are very successful. They will buy the paintings and the artworks and the photographies. And then we plot back all the money. We never took one cover out of the proceeds. So we've been able to make sales of millions and millions. But it's funny that all that came from a tragedy. Um, I'd been in a very, very difficult marriage. And I needed to travel just to get well. And so I needed to be traveling the world, you know, my doctor recommended travel and things like that. So as I traveled, photography made it easy for me to uh, be able to deal with the difficulties I was in, you know, and I was taking all those photographs and all those, and when I come back, we'll develop the photographs and everything. So when you combine my passion for arts and photography, the question is, what do we do with this talent? And that was how we started using it to raise money for the less privileged and for orphanages, which we've done for so many years now, and continue to do. Hmm. Yes, I wanted you to tell me, you see, they say the more you travel, the more educated you become. Can you tell me some of the places you've been and the education you brought back? Well, the, the, I, I, don't, I don't go to places because um, everybody goes there. Um, for example, I once went to Bilbao, Bilbao is somewhere in Spain. But the reason I went to Bilbao was because of the museum there. So when, even when we plan family itinerary, the first thing that my wife makes sure 
that is on that itinerary is a visit to a modern art museum. You know, so I go to such places. Um, Rome is a favorite place to me because of so much history. Um, I used to go to Ghana because of so much history. It has to be a place that resonates. Uh, I went to Cape Verde because I wanted to understand how such a small country could be punching above its weight. Um, I went to Senegal because I wanted to understand why Dakar was what it was. And, and so many places, I mean, I've traveled to China um, about three times. And when I got to China, I got to learn about world views, how they see black men. As at the first time I went to China with my colleague, we went on work. Uh, some, sometimes my work takes me to all these other places as well. But they, some of the people had never seen a black person. I mean, it was shocking. This was like 18 years ago. Wow. And it was really, really shocking for me. And their views of blacks and everything was a bit disturbing for me. Um, and I, I lost a camera in China, a ten thousand dollar camera, you know. And but they, they say the more you travel, the more you see other perspectives, and the more you learn to respect people's cultures and world views, and to know that your European American perspective is not the totality of the world. And that you must respect other people's views, you must respect other races, you must respect other people's perspectives and cultures. And I've only come back enlightened and has made me a global citizen, you know. And it's, and if you don't have money to travel, I always tell people read magazines. You know, is the cheapest and fastest way to travel. Read books. When I read Kofi Awuno, um, 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 uh, my family and other animals. Uh, I had been to Greece in primary school before I went to Greece in real life. And so by the time oh. I got to Greece, I understood Greece. I understood their pride. I understand. I mean, this was the land of Pythagoras, Archimedes, and all these people. And I understood why the Greeks behave the way they behave. You know, they're very proud lot who are very proud of their heritage and things like that. And I went to the Acropolis and all those places. It can only enrich you. It can only enrich you. The more you open yourself to other people, the more enriched you are and the more appreciative of humanity you become. And we need that, especially in Nigeria, because the whole essence of National Youth Service Corps in the first place is to take us around the country so that we can appreciate other people's cultures, other people's views, and respect them and be able to forge a federation out of these disparate entities that form the plethora called Nigeria. Hmm. Wow. Now there is crisis everywhere, and uh, what is your attitude to COVID-19? Because there seems to be too much confusion at the moment. It's, it's, it's what it is. There's nothing you can do. Um, what I always tell, what I advise businesses is that they have to adopt a strategy of REC. The first one is resilience. You have to be mentally conditioned to accept that this thing has come to stay. We don't know how it will go. We don't know when it will go. It may be a year. It may be two years. Only God knows. So you have to be psychologically prepared to accept it for what it is and to live with it. So that means that you have to go online as much as possible. Um, there will be limitations in terms of interactions and any of all those things. The second thing that I tell business is that they have to be enterprising. You just can't sit down there and be moping and, and be crying and be feeling sorry for yourself. Of what use is that? Especially if you are the head of your family. And the last thing is that you have to be creative. And all of us have creativity. It's just that we've never been pushed to the point of creativity. So resilience, enterprise, and creativity. That is what you need to do as a businessman. But COVID-19 has come to stay. Uh, what I did during that uh, period was also, I also wrote a novel, a novella. Uh, which I will release and serialize on Twitter from next week, hopefully. Um, wow. You know, because I'm also a writer, <laughs> you know, so I wrote a novel just looking at things in Nigeria and the world from the perspective of COVID-19 and the problems that we have in Nigeria and neglect of social services and the consequences of that neglect and why our country is the way it is, why there seems to be no change after 50-something years of independence. You know, um, so I'm, I'm I, like everybody in my generation, I'm examining things and I'm examining the reasoning of the Awolowos of this world, the Sadanas of this world, and the Oparas of this world, and the Azikiwes of this world. 
what world did they live in? Are we still confronted with the issues that they faced in those days? I mean, those are the kind of things that I'm examining because my children's perspective are completely different from my perspective. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, in the area of world travels, now there is major, major crisis in the United States. Can you just foretell what is to come? Because it doesn't seem like it's going to go away quickly this time. It's, it's, a, it's a <clears throat> you know, I always tell people that intelligence is not based on the coloration of your skin and that all good and perfect things don't come from abroad, they come from above. Um, when you don't accept the sacredness of life, when you don't accept that God has created everyone equal, you are bound to keep on having this kind of problems in which a man with impunity can take another person's life in broad daylight and with so much impunity, so much impunity. And the question that America is faced with is the question of the sacredness of the black life. And oh. it's a question that will continue to haunt America for some time. Uh, the sacredness of life. The sacredness of life. You can't, you can't genocidally approach a whole race of people with a philosophy of insignificance. You can't approach a race of people with an eradicative mindset. It's not possible. Um, the blacks are here. America is what it is. Face it, history is history. These people were slaves. They are no longer slaves. And that is a challenge that some people in America, not everyone, because there are wonderful white people in America. I met several, you know, and most that I know are not racist. But they are just those bad eggs, you know. They're, they're just so bad eggs. Who can't accept? It's like the same problem we had in South Africa and still have in South Africa where you can't accept a black person as an achiever or as an equal. It's a problem. And there's nothing anybody can, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Some people are wired genetically to see the black man in a particular way. It's going to take time, you know, um, but I'm praying that we get over it. It's sick. Even if black man got a big $20 bill, even if, how does a man lose his life over a fake $20 bill? which some now contend is not even fake. Wow. Wow. Okay. Before we go to the next topic, we play <laughs> for you Michael Jackson. Do they really care about us? So let's have Michael Jackson. <laughs> Interesting when I asked for your choice of music, number one was Michael Jackson. That's and Michael right. Jackson has, happens to be my, my best, my favorite. I even attended his funeral. Oh, wow. Yes, I <laughs> traveled all the way to Los Angeles to attend his yeah, funeral. That's yeah, how well, crazy. I loved you. <laughs> how crazy I was about Michael Jackson, you know? Yes. No, uh, let, let, me was, add something. let me add something that respects the Nigerian situation. Okay. I am not sure that we as Nigerians value life itself. Hmm. I think it's our numbers. I think we're too many. And so when we lose one or two, it doesn't matter to we us. We don't care. We don't care. So, and perhaps that occurred when we started shooting people at the bar beach in broad daylight 
and therefore impacting the psyche of the people not to see the sacredness of life, perhaps. But that's even extremity. What I'm particular about is the potential in the life of a young man or woman. Take a small child that is born. A nation has to look at the potential of that life and invest appropriately into that life because if you value that life, you will make the appropriate investments. And I'm not sure we're making enough investments in the lives of the average Nigerian. So I'm, as we are pointing fingers at America, we should be pointing fingers at ourselves as well. It's not about whether somebody is dead physically. The question is, are they virtually dead by virtue of under development or under potentiation or under investment in their lives? And we need to do that as a nation. We need to pay more attention to health. We need to pay more attention to social services. We need to pay more attention to safety. We need to pay, you know, our society is too power defined. Where, every, where might is right and where uniform gives you enormous rights and privileges that shouldn't be. Uh. So in a way, we're also guilty of exactly the same thing that we're accusing the Americans of. It's just that we're not putting a knee on the neck of someone, but in another way, we're putting our knees on the neck of young men so that they are not, I mean, Bob, without education, will you be what you are today? The schools I went to, there's no way my father could afford it when you think about it in real terms. I'm paying, I paid a lot to give my children the equivalence of the kind of education that I had. I'm saying we need to pay attention to the underprivileged, the people we're not paying attention to, because if we don't, the people are coming. Hmm. The people are coming. What? Now, I want you to go into a subject that I can see a lot of people on this platform are interested in. What is the philosophy of crisis and conflict and incompatibility in marriage? Huh. <laughs> This is this is this is where it starts, Bob D. It always starts at choice. Once the choice is wrong, you see where we make mistakes is that we try to ameliorate a bad choice. Once the choice is wrong, chances are that the marriage will go bad. And how do we get choices wrong? By concentrating on only ephemerality, like the physical dimensions of a woman or only on the material acquisition of a man. That is the easiest way to get things wrong. Whereas the things that really, really matter are character, um, not the personality. Personality is for friendship. It matters. All those things matter. I'm not saying the physical doesn't matter. But once your parameter of choice is wrong, you are going to get into trouble. And that's why a lot of young people are getting into trouble, where it's all about sex. And once you get out of the sexual medium, then there's nothing left again. But then you've been married for so many years. You and I know that what sustains marriage is friendship. If you cannot be friends with someone, if you cannot stay with someone for long without fight, without dissimulation, and all those kinds of things, then you are going to have problems in marriage. So I found that that Choice is where the problem starts. Get your choice right, and it's easier from way, you know, from going forward. Now, some have made wrong choices. So the question is, what do you do? Well, you make the best of what you can. Both of you should sit down as adults and work out the compatibility issues because the, people think it's so easy to get out of marriage. They don't know that marriage is costly to get out of. And that the thing about marriage is that it's a processing medium. If you enter at one end, you can never come out of the other end the same. It's not possible. That's why some people never end up never getting remarried. That's why some people end up being so bitter. Even if you look at a parent's generation, you find your parents still complaining about your mother, what your mother did in 1952, 1942, because there's so much bitterness about marriage, because marriage is so intimate. And you can't have an enemy in an intimate situation. So there has to be compatibility. There has to be love. 
I know people don't pay attention to love, you know, they only pay attention to emotional love. But there are two dimensions of love. There's emotional love, there's also dutiful love. You cannot be a man and not be responsible. It's not possible. Your wife will not respond, will not respect you. So those are the things that I think a lot of people need to pay attention. I tell people, if you don't have a job, don't get married. Not mm. because your wife doesn't love you, but because when the pressures come, you are going to lose the respect that you need as a man. You are going to lose your self-confidence as a man. You don't have to be a millionaire. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, be respected as a man. Let your children be able to respect you. Let your children know that daddy is sacrificing, which is very important. As a woman, you've got to love this man because if you don't love a man, it's a very, very thin line between love and hatred in marriage. Wow. My respect for you quadrupled. It didn't double, it didn't triple. It quadrupled when I saw the way you handled the crisis of your previous marriage and how you were able to remain intact with your children. How did you manage that? Well, first of all, um, it was a, it was a, it was a very, very, it was an extremely, extremely traumatic experience for me that lasted over a 10 year period. Um, I was in and out of hospital for 10 years. I mean, my doctor had a permanent suite in the hospital for me. And every week I was admitted or I was being flown abroad or my blood samples were being flown abroad and things like that. But I did not know what the problem was. And the other party could not understand what the problem was. But later I realized that it looked as if we succeeded too fast and she just couldn't handle that. I'm trying my best to try and understand whatever might have gone on with her. And um, because when I asked her what the problem was, she said I was a problem. Now that's an insolvable problem. Um, oh. How do you solve that kind of problem? Um, but up till now, I don't have any bitterness. I don't have any hatred. I don't have any malice. I tell the children, the Bible says you should honor your father and your mother. So you must honor your mother no matter how you feel about her, no matter what you feel she's done or whatever it is, you must honor her as your mother. And, um, and family is important to me. And I don't know, you don't, you don't look back and regret. I made up my mind for a long time, for example, that I would never even say a word to anybody and that I will bear all the recrimination. You know, I mean, it's not funny when you're on the front page of City People twice, uh, center spread of punch, center spread of this day, you're on radio, you're everywhere. But I bought it with equanimity because I understood that that is life and that's the way life will be. But what was important to me was moving forward uh, and making sure that I'm not a bitter, angry person who is holding grudge against somebody. I don't hold grudges. I don't believe in grudges. Um, I also wanted to make sure that my children are okay emotionally and that so that they don't carry such bitterness into their, uh, such experiences into their homes. Because that's nothing to do with them. It's a boy and a girl who met each other, who couldn't work it out together, and that's it. And then um, I kept on, even without um, any courts ruling or any of those things, I kept on supporting my ex-wife and her family. And then um, even after we separated, I kept on sending money to our mother in Ibadan. You know, every month, exactly the same amount of money that I gave my father and my mother, I kept on doing that for about a year, even after we had separated them and things like that. And then I, I've done what I could for her. Um, now, whether she accepts that or whether she feels that that is enough, that's another thing entirely. Um, but I don't know. Life is what it is. And anyway, God has been kind to me. So what, why will I hold a grudge against anybody? I don't have any scintilla of grudge whatsoever against her even though she put my life through hell. Wow. Well, I'm happy that I witnessed a happy day in your life. And I feel eternally grateful to you for that invitation to France, where we had the best of time in the chateau. Could you tell us? <laughs> You're a man of taste. So let's go to the happy side of life. How did you plan such a fantastic, a fabulous wedding. 
<laughs> well, uh, I I'd, I'd met this wonderful woman, uh, which is quite funny, you know. Um, so I'd gone through all those experiences, and for two years, I didn't go anywhere. I, I mean, I didn't go out at all. All I did was I would go from work to home and then from home to church. That's all I did for two years. And then I went to England and then um, one of my staff had met this wonderful and beautiful lady in a gym. And they exchanged cards. And before I came back from England, she it turned out that she was a brand manager for a corporation. And so she gave us a job. And after she gave us a job, I came back from England. It seemed like a straightforward job, but there was a problem on the job and I couldn't locate what the problem was. So I called the meeting in-house and I tried to find out what the issue was because I wasn't even directly involved in that job. They couldn't tell me what the issue was. So I said, okay, let me meet the brand manager to get a sense of what the problem is, you know, so that I can meet the MD and we can resolve it CEO to CEO. And then she came in and she seemed like such a fair and simple person, very fair. And I listened to her. So I said, okay, organize a meeting between me and your CEO. And so she went back to the CEO. Later, I will let her learn that the CEO actually told her, she told her she must come and fight us. But she said, no, I'm not going to fight them. I'm just going to listen to the truth. And whatever the truth is, I'll report back to you. So she went back to the CEO and said, you know, that the CEO of that company is such a wonderful person. Now, I didn't know it then, but later I later learned. She said I was the first executive that she was meeting who never hit on her, never tried to date her, never tried to, never told her, oh, you look beautiful or any of those things. And that she was just wondering that, is this guy normal or is he for real, you know? So later I met the CEO and along the way, we became friends. And um, and she's, I mean, Bobby, you know her. She's such a kind, <sighs> it's, it's, um, it's hard to think of my wife and not be emotional. Uh, she's such a kind and sacrificial person. Um, people think it was the beauty that attracted me to her. I never saw the beauty at all, you know, which is funny. You know, God can hide things from you. I never saw that she was beautiful until after we finished the engagement, which is strange. Uh, but she's such, such a kind person. And then there was all this noise about me. And, uh, you know, I, I like quietude. So which was why we had to get married out of the country. Uh, and we chose the end of France. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but because of the kind of person that she is, I wanted to give her a, such a beautiful wedding. You know, so what we decided to do was to make it a small affair and call people like you, who we consider friends and family, about 20 mm. people uh, to France. And it was such a beautiful wedding, such a, such ah. a, beautiful, such a beautiful wedding. And, mm. and I thank God forever that I met this woman in my life, forever. Wow, wow! No, that was my best trip. I've been to Paris, to France, so many times, but that was the first time I was sleeping in a chateau. <laughs> it was, it was absolutely uh, fabulous. Now, Bobby, you're leaking, you're leaking my secrets now. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, 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 so. It was so nice. We so wanted nice. it to be an exclusive wedding, and we didn't want something that you know you can't you can't chance upon it. Mm. So it took a lot of meticulous planning because we didn't want the press to even know that we were getting married. For the first you know? time, you refused. I couldn't hear you pictures. I was so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I still feel bad that I did that to you. Well, thank oh you my for God. Uh, you can't <laughs> apologize for me. Please understand. I said, no, how can I be in the place? So make sure not. <laughs> in her, and, and what was wonderful was that my daughter was the chief bridesmaid and my son it, it, was the best. I said, that's what got me that your daughter agreed to be the chief bridesmaid to her <laughs> step mom. I've never seen anything like it. Never. No, they know the truth and they know their dad. And then. Um, wow. There are challenges in life. Sometimes people just can't handle the blessings that God gives them. 
Um, mm. When we, I mean, I had nothing, absolutely nothing. I started all that consulting with 17 Naira 50 Kogo, and God has been kind and gracious to us. Um, but she just couldn't handle the fame and the success and everything. It was just difficult for her. I don't know why, but some people just can't handle such things. And then it was just so difficult for her. And she made my life hell. because, And I didn't know how to solve it because do we now pray for poverty? Mm. <laughs> you know? You can't pray, and, pray for poverty. Wow. You can't. You, you can't repudiate the blessings of God on your life. Wow. And the fame and everything, and God knows I don't cut it. And I'm very reticent and private. In my family, for example, if you notice on, on social media, for example, you never see my children use their surname. No, my wife doesn't even use her surname on social media. I mean, we're that quiet, you know, and everything. But this is what God has given us. And it's not meant for us. It's meant to inspire other people. Hmm. We thank God always. Oh, my hmm. God. <laughs> we spent one hour, 25 minutes. I think I should allow you to go back to Madame now. Uh, I've made you to reveal too, too much already, but I want to sincerely thank you, Mr. Thank Lake you. Elder, Professor Socrates. Your name is never complete until I add <laughs> Professor Socrates. My warmest regards to your wife, to your family. God bless you all but we will play yet another music by popular demand this time for you and madam. Thank you so much. privilege and may God continue to bless ovation and thank spread you, its wings and take it globally in the name thank of you Jesus. So thank amen. you. Amen. Amen. Thank amen. you, sir. There, thank tomorrow you. evening we'll be having a man I respect so much, our more the retired assistant inspector general of police to Jalakini. Oh my God. You, you will never believe we've had such great men in the Nigeria police until we start talking to him tomorrow. I look forward to that conversation. So, God bless you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, my viewers. Thank you. God bless you all.